What are the main attributes a developer needs to transition into architecture? Well, I think there's, there's a couple. I would say the primary attribute is people skills. We talk a lot about the technology aspects of architecture. There's certainly lingo to learn. Uh, there's a lot of patterns to learn. There's uh, processes that are different than a developer. But, but really, what I think one of the core things is, is those people skills. That, in my opinion, is the challenging thing. So it's really having the grounding to be able to get along with people. That's about 50% of what I think a, an effective software architect really does. 50%? Wow, about, that's, that's in my tremendous. opinion, yeah. I think, I think and that's, and that's where I see. There's technical architects, sure. and sure, they can architect solutions, but architecture is more than just drawing the boxes and lines. It's more than just understanding the right solution. It's being able to lead the teams through the implementation of your architecture. It's being able to work with teams. It's being able to get developer buy-in, stakeholder buy-in. And so, so that underlying being able to work with people is really one of those attributes to become a real effective architect. And then there's another interesting thing that happens, actually, Mac, in this, and that is, that is uh, uh, what I like to call a kind of an inflection point or uh, a change really that you have to work on and that's how we think as developers because when I approach technology as a developer I take a deep dive in that technology I really need to know it and as an architect it's really a different way of thinking in other words you have to have the quality attributes within a developer to be able to focus more on breadth and depth and that's very hard it may sound easier than it seems, but it's really not. And so focusing on the breath is stopping yourself to say, I understand closure now, I understand what it does, but I can't program in it. Mm. And it's almost like that imposter syndrome kind of coming in, and it's really not. And so that's one of the, the other attributes, is to be able to start changing your way of thinking, to focus more on technical breadth versus the depth, and that's, that's one of those attributes as well. That kind of leads me to my next question. Are, what are the most common mistakes that new software architects make? Is that one of them? Oh, it, it is. It is really focusing on breadth. That's actually a good, a, a, a good observation because it's not getting that breadth of knowledge. But the other mistakes I see, there's two kinds of architects that a, somebody just coming into software architect can be. And one of those I like to call is a control freak architect. In other words, it's not understanding those boundaries that exist between the role of developer and the role of architect. And so in other words, that confusion about what am I supposed to do as an architect? And where the line gets drawn between defining a component, that responsibility, and also then its operations, mm -hmm. but not designing that component. And so going off to say, well, now I'm gonna do the class diagram. I know exactly how I would implement that because I have been a developer. Mm -hmm. And so as the architect, it's realizing and appreciating and respecting that boundary because a lot of control freak architects and those especially coming from development into architecture will steal that art away mm -hmm. from the developer. And so even writing pseudo code, and so that's one of the other. Right. However, there's another personality that this leads towards, and that's the armchair architect personality. <laughs> and this is uh, one of those where you are overwhelmed or maybe way over your head. Mm -hmm. And so the tendency is to become overly vague as an architect and not supply the right level of detail. And this particularly comes in with the lack of domain knowledge as well. And when I say domain knowledge, I mean business domain knowledge. So, so that's, uh, those, are, those are definitely two things that I, I see uh, struggles with becoming uh, an architect is, is really uh, understanding those boundaries and understanding the role of an architect. Right. I could see how maturation would inevitably lead to finding the middle ground between those two things, yes, right? Yes, yes, exactly. Uh, is there an industry-wide definition for software architect or is it largely defined by organizations themselves? No, no. <laughs> Next question. That's no, good. no. <laughs> you know this is this is a big problem and will always be a big problem. Are you a technical architect, solutions architect, application architect, integration architect, enterprise architect? I can continue on with probably about another dozen titles. Mm -hmm. And this is the problem: is the titles, in my opinion, will probably, or even the role of an architect, will never be standardized. Every industry is as part of your question. Yes, every company has their own set of roles. However, there is some level of standard that we can actually apply. It's not really the role, 
but there are core expectations of an architect. And this is really the key to focus on. The role's gonna change on every company. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you'll be the Uber developer, sure. and sometimes you will be the visionary. But regardless if you're a network architect, an application architect, an enterprise architect, a technical architect, solution architect, there are core expectations. Let me give you an example of a few of those. For example, um, assessing the current technology environment and recommending solutions for improvement. And whether this, this is assessing the architecture vitality. It's not in the job description. But this is something an architect is expected to do. Because if that architecture no longer supports those applications, no one is going to know. And that's when you get applications that kind of, quote, implode mm -hmm. in these big refactoring efforts. Analyzing current industry and technical trends and technology trends. This is crucial for an architect. It's not on the job description. This is one of the things an architect has to do. Uh, uh, ex exceptional interpersonal skills, teamwork, facilitation, negotiation. It's leading teams, again. Uh, these are core expectations. This is a great one. I love this one. Understanding the political climate of the <laughs> enterprise and being able to navigate politics. And you know what's interesting, Mac? I get pushback on that kind of, well, no, 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 I'm, that's not part of my job, that's mm -hmm. not part of my job description. But guess what? You have a developer who's wanting to reduce cyclometic complexity inside their code. So what do they do? They choose to use the strategy pattern. Who cares? No one cares. Mm -hmm. However, I as the architect am going to be making decisions. I make the decision that all application databases and their uh, all applications in their corresponding database will be siloed. That has huge ramifications because it is affecting all applications that need to talk to your data. Mm -hmm. So in other words, the point is the decisions you make as an architect uh, will be challenged. And that's why you have to understand the political climate of the enterprise. That's why you need to navigate politics and negotiate. And so there are examples of, of, of three out of many of those mm -hmm. core expectations of an architect. So the thing which I usually coach developers on and also uh, uh, budding architects is don't focus so much on the job description. That's what you need to do. Mm -hmm. Focus on those core expectations. I think it's interesting you're referring to them as expectations as opposed to transferable skills. Mm. That's a much different dynamic. It is, it is, it is. And these are things that uh, also uh, what uh, mistakes a lot of architects make. I kind of already talked about those. Mm -hmm. One of those others, others is not understanding these expectations. In mm -hmm. other words, sticking to the role. Say, my role is not to work with the development teams. So that expectation though is you're going to lead them. And so it's really, that's what I see the definition of an architect. The role's going to vary. Last question for you. Sure. What do established software architects need to do to stay current? <sighs> One it word. sounds like there's a lot, an awful lot the, that they need to keep on top of. There is. And really, uh, I'll answer it in one word, trends. Analyzing and understanding trends. Mm -hmm. I use three resources to do this. I try to do this thing I like to call a 30-minute rule. It's kind of gone down, based on my bandwidth, to a 15-minute rule. Right. Spend 15 minutes a day looking at resources, such as the uh, ThoughtWorks technology radar. That's mm -hmm. one that I always look at. And I look at it to see what's trending, but also I look at that to humble myself. Because you look at the list of platforms, technologies, tools, and I say, I don't even know what <laughs> half of those are, right. and half of those are trending. And that is a humbling experience. And so I will spend 15, 10, five minutes, depending on the context, to actually say, what are those? Mm -hmm. And then if one piques my interest, or I say that might be a good solution, I take a deeper dive. And that's about building that technology radar that my friend Neil Ford continually talks about. Uh, InfoQ, info and then the letter Q.com is another one of my favorites. I go there almost every day. I look at the digest and I see pony, comma, jigsaw, comma, and it's like, pony, I've never heard of pony. I go and look at it and it's like, oh, this is an interesting language. This is what I'm talking about, about developing that breadth. It's understanding what's trending, what's not, because I, as an architect, am advising clients on long-term, potentially long-term decisions. I have to understand those trends, what's trending, what's not, what's going out, what's going in, and that serves my clients well. Great. Well, thanks so much for being with us. Okay. Great. Thank you, Mike.